right. All right. It looks like we have some attendees. Everyone's trickling in. So we're just going to give it another minute um, and then we can get started. I think we can get started now. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our MarketSmith Think webinar, Smart Start and Think Ahead Using Research and Marketing. My name is Nicole Chiarella, and I'm the Director of Corporate Marketing here at MarketSmith and your MC for today's session. Uh, to start off, I just want to go through a little housekeeping. Your control panel is in the upper right-hand corner of your screen. If you can't see it, it may be collapsed. So to expand the control panel, click on the orange button with the white arrow to see more options. Everyone is automatically muted, so don't worry if your next door neighbor's landscaper shows up, we won't hear it. Um, your active participation is important during this session. You can ask questions throughout that will be answered towards the end of the session by opening the questions module within your control panel. These questions will be sent directly to me without the ability for any attendees to see them. A recorded version of this webinar will be available within the next few days and will be sent out to everyone who registered as well as linked on our social pages, which you'll see here. Please join us uh, by tagging and following us on social, our handle is at MarketSmithInc. Now, if everyone is ready, let's begin. Before I introduce you to today's experts, for anyone not familiar with MarketSmith, we are an award-winning full-service marketing agency located in Whippany, New Jersey, with a proven history in driving growth for brands at all stages in their life cycle. From product launches to changing brand perception, we approach every campaign with transparency, end-to-end -end measurement, and ROI-driven goals. Now, a little about today's panelists. Desiree Marin is our VP of Client Performance here at MarketSmith. She is a seasoned professional with proven results in meeting client goals and managing budgets to ensure successful campaigns. Her experience is deeply rooted in the state of New Jersey and she is highly focused on targeted campaigns that speak directly to segmented audiences. She serves as our in-house expert on regionalized strategy across creative, media, and outcome generation. Outside of work, Desiree loves to cook and visit different craft breweries, both in New Jersey and throughout her travels. Next, we have our EVP of brand strategy, Joseph Sharp. With 20 plus years of experience within media, Joe has always worn many hats, including planning, research, and analytics. He is a data-driven collaborator, relentless team mentor, and client advocate with expertise across a diverse vertical set, including retail, finance, CPG, automotive, QSR, telecom, entertainment, and tourism. Whether focused on the here and now or looking to the future, Joe is always keeping his eyes open, driving campaign strategy, and building and enhancing tools within our agency. When he isn't focused on client goals, he can usually be found behind a camera trying to find his next favorite picture. So please join me in welcoming Desiree and Joe. Thank you for having us. It's great to be here. Thanks for that introduction, Nicole. Welcome. So today we're going to discuss what goes into building a well-informed marketing plan. And in this case, starting at the beginning with research. At the end of this webinar, we hope you'll all have a better sense of what goes into primary and secondary research. 
and how is a key step to ensuring your marketing plan begins on the right foot. So I'd like to pose a scenario to you two. You have a client that would like to speak to a very small niche target, but they're just not sure how to actually reach that target. What's the first thing you should do? Uh, Joe, would you like to go first? Absolutely. Um, well, Nicole, it's one of my favorite words and the reason we're here today. Research. That's the building block. That's how we build our foundation for all of our plans, our measurement, our optimizations. When you think about it, every opportunity that you take to learn something is research. Every plan execution that we implement is an experiment whose results are data for research. Every client brief that we receive is research to be analyzed to inform our target selections and to build our media plans. I know we're going to get more into that a little bit later, um, but so I don't want to spoil it, but research touches every part of our business. It gives us the foundation that we need to be successful for our clients. Um, and when we look at research, it comes in two basic forms, primary and secondary. There's a lot of subgroups uh, within that, um, but those are the two overarching forms that I hope we'll, we'll discuss today and that everyone will have a better understanding when we leave today. Um, and here at MarketSmith, we employ those in various ways depending on our needs and depending on our clients' needs at the time, um, including our state clients. And that's where, you know, working very closely with Des and her team um, come in handy. Yeah, definitely. And thinking about New Jersey and the surrounding areas where we focus a lot of our campaigns for our state, regional, and localized clients, there is so much diversity and so many different target audiences that we're trying to reach. We call it the melting pot you know, of New Jersey. We know that we are just such a di diverse group and we need to speak to the people in, you know, in that way. So, um, you know, looking at many different target audiences we're trying to reach through our ad placements, our messages, our communications. So one of the first things we do um, is really identify who we're trying to reach and where and how to best speak to these consumers um, through, of course, the topic of the day, research. Um, by focusing in on information that's available uh, to us and using existing con uh, consumer data, you know, coupled with like things like the latest 2020 census uh, figures, you know, we can drill down based on demographics such as age, income, uh, key demographics, key geographies. You know, there's so much uh, information available to us that we really have to utilize it, uh, you know, in our best interest and in our, in our clients' program's best interest. So it sounds like primary and secondary research are the first steps in building out your strategic foundation. So what exactly are primary and secondary research and how do you use them to build out strategy? Uh, that's a great place to start and I'll, I'll jump right in if that's okay. Um, primary and secondary research, like I said, are, are the two basic forms and there's many, many subsets, but let's start with primary research or first party research. So essentially this is when you go out and you collect the data directly. This is in any number of forms, but some of those sub forms of primary research are surveys, online surveys, on paper surveys, in-person surveys, uh, interviews, focus groups, ethnographies, uh, simple basic observation. Um, these are all forms of primary research. Critical piece that defines primary versus secondary though, is that you're gathering the data directly and analyzing it directly for your purposes. So for example, if I wanted to know, say, what media channels are most important to a person in New Jersey who's deciding on where to go for their next in-state staycation, I might devise a survey to find a group of consumers who are in that marketplace, ask them where they're gathering the most useful information for their trip. Coincidentally, I'd be doing primary research to learn about their primary research. In addition to giving us insights, sorry, that's my research brain geeking out. Um, in addition to giving us insight into where I could advertise or reach folks who are interested in, uh, in vacation planning, I can also include demographic questions, geographic questions, psychographic questions, so that I can better understand 
what they're most interested in, where they might be going, what are the deciding factors for them. All of that can be used then to inform you know, our, our plans, our targets, et cetera. Um, this is just one example of, of what primary research is. At MSI, I said it before, we employ a multitude of primary research tools, focus groups, custom surveys, quantitative and qualitative. Um, it really runs the gamut. Um, and from an analytics perspective, right, how do we use this? We take all of this information and work with our creative teams and our uh, client performance teams and our media teams to inform how and what we activate for each one of our clients. Um, secondary research, on the other hand, is essentially where you've taken someone else's published information or data and you're summarizing it for your use, right? So that can be an existing database, it can be literature, uh, it could be someone else's uh, focus group results. But the key differentiator between primary and secondary is someone else published that data, that information that you're taking and using for your own purposes. Um, can provide, so when we think about secondary research, it can provide loads and loads of useful information um, and insights um, that could even be used to inform primary research. Uh, a good example for, uh, for my MSI attendees, the recent updates that I've started doing on the economy. Um, I gather data from various sources, government uh, and private businesses, studies, economic white papers, um, articles just on what's going on in the world. I take all of that information in and I summarize the key points that I think are most relevant for that particular day or that particular week and share those out. I'm taking someone else's information, evaluating and analyzing it and sharing it with my teams. So we have a bevy of tools here. Um, they're infinitely flexible depending on our client's needs. So whether we're looking for creative testing, finding our targets, analyzing our client's first party data, we're able to employ any and all of that research to inform our plan activations. Yeah, and to uh, just quickly add to that, we found the most effective research approach for our clients and brands incorporates the mix of primary and secondary research. They really work together in that qualitative and quantitative way. So evaluating all of that secondary research that Joe just talked about that's already out there, that already exists, that's applicable to our clients, you know, and uh, coupling that to fill in the gaps of what we need to do for primary research. What are we missing that we might want to do a survey to find out more on? What, um, what focus group would really help us drill down and get to like, you know, real insightful information coming from the consumers that would be most interested in our products and services and messages. So um, that's been the most successful uh, research approach that we found. So, Des, that's actually a great segue into my next question for you. Um, so let's say a new campaign needs to be developed for a client and we're getting ready to kick off the project. What exactly goes into conducting that research at the outset of a marketing campaign? And since you gave me that Greg's great segue, Des, I will throw this one to you first. Yes, so definitely this goal setting and discovery, this first step here that you see on that, um, you know, on, on the screen, it's really crucial and it's something that we're doing day in and day out with our clients, you know, in formal ways and informal ways. So when a client advertiser or brand is ready to launch a, a new initiative, a new project, a new campaign, everyone's so eager to just hit the ground running and everyone thinks they have so many ideas that they think are gonna make a successful campaign. So it's really important to take that moment, align, take a step back during this goal setting and discovery phase so during this exploratory exercise, we really debrief with the client and our internal teams to gather all that historical information that we just talked about and, you know, evaluate what's worked and what hasn't worked, the knowns of the campaign or initiative and the unknowns and come to the agreements, you know, with the overall goals, um, you know, for the campaign and what is really needed to achieve them. So the objective of this first phase in the process is, you know, to get to a place where we create really informed marketing plans, um, you know, that will have better performance and efficient outcomes based on these established goals and KPIs. You know, it's going in really, really well organized um, and, you know, something that 
we won't go into a lot of detail here, but you know, we also work into this phase, you know, developing learning agendas, where are the things that we want to be able to test and you know, work into our different um, you know, initiatives. Uh, so you know, it's something that keeps that going throughout the, the process. So Joe, you know, you were talking about tools prior, but um, when it comes to primary and secondary, how does your analytics team work in tandem with what Desiree and the account team are doing as far as understanding the client goals and using the tools to help craft a strategy? Yeah, that's it, it's a, a great segue. And Des, I want to thank you for touching on learning agendas, because that's sort of the, the heart and soul. We won't again get too deep into it, but that's the heart and soul of how we plan out our research plans and how we do work together um, is through those those learning agendas. So what we do is we take that discovery research, depending on the needs of our client, we develop a research plan to understand those unknowns that Des talked about. Um, we can dig deeper into those. We can start pulling them apart. We also look at the knowns and, and want to understand those more deeply as well. Um, so we frequently will start with secondary research, actually, where we'll look at syndicated sources such as an MRI or a Cantar, um, or even things like census data. And we'll start with a very broad stroke overview of what do we know right now about this person or about this consumer target. Um, from there, that information gives us a good foundation to start, again, peeling back the onion, if you will, um, so we can get into other areas of focus, things that we weren't really sure about, things we might not have known, or opportunities that we see. That generally will lead us into our primary research, so we can dig deeper, usually in the form of a survey, focus groups, so we can start with some qualitative and some quantitative data. Even in cases where our clients come to us with lots of information, lots of data and research of their own, we still find it very valuable to develop our own surveys, field our own focus groups, and dig into our own secondary research as well so we can be more informed. Um, generally, from there, we'll move back into secondary research. We now have a much deeper understanding of who our target is, we have a good understanding of the channels and the media mix that really get their juices flowing, so to speak. Um, so we dig back in with new questions to ask out of our secondary research. Um, and from there, what we do is start to uncover the nuances, the media consumption nuances, the target segment nuances. Um, and we haven't really talked about it much, but the competitive landscape, also part of our secondary research, when we dig deeper into that, we can find gaps, we can find overlaps where we can help our clients stand out. Um, so that's sort of the starting point for from a research and analytics and reporting perspective where we build all of that, uh, all that primary research and all of the uh, discovery from the clients into our day to day plans. Yeah, so I mean, it sounds like there are a lot of building blocks that are used to then get to, you know, crafting that final strategy um, to go to market. So it's really, it's really interesting to see it kind of go from, from beginning to end here. And I'd like to get um, our audience involved and see what they think of when they hear the word research. So um, if everyone that's attending can let us know in the chat box of what they think of when they hear the word research. Um, I'll read them off as they come in. I'll just give it a minute. All right, so I see a few here. Um, I see information um i see strategy uh discovery feedback um someone said lab coat lots of equipment <laughs> um let's see challenge um exciting demographic insight i think that's a really smart answer 
and someone who probably three. knows research. <laughs> um, let's see. I think that's it. But those are oh tools. Um, Nicole, focus. no one said no one said Davy. Our our research no director. One said Davy. <laughs> when I hear the word research, I think Davy. <laughs> Yeah, yeah so I always think curiosity when I think research. Information and, and discovery and curiosity to me all go hand in hand with research. Yeah, definitely. And I think that's a it's an interesting mix of words. You know, I think there's there's adjectives and nouns and verbs here. I, I think the lab coat one was probably my favorite. Um, <laughs> yeah. but it is it's why we host webinars like office. this, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. All right. Um, so now that you've taken us through some ways that you would use research, can you give me some examples of how you've utilized it for clients? Um, I've outlined a couple of focuses here if you have examples to share. So Des, uh, ladies first. Yeah, so we have a lot of examples of how we've utilized creative testing, um, you know, in our research process for our clients since we do develop uh, and execute on um, the creative side of the campaigns along with the, the media execution that we'll talk about a little bit too. So um, one example that I want to take everyone through is um, Market Smith and one of our current partners, the New Jersey Board of Public Utilities. Um, we're gearing up to launch a statewide awareness campaign for the New Jersey Clean Energy Program. There hadn't been any marketing or advertising efforts behind the clean energy program in all, almost 10 years. So we really had a lot of work to do to bring that back and to, you know, start seeding, you know, this to New Jersey again, that this program was out there and available to them. So, you know, looking at, you know, engaging in research at the forefront of the project was necessary to ensure the direction, strategy, and delivery of our campaign approach would really resonate with our core target audiences, who was general New Jersey residents and homeowners, as well as a commercial and small business audience. So how we did this was, you know, putting our, our thoughts and ideas down to paper and then getting um, focus groups together. So we conducted multiple in-person focus groups, you know, probably about eight to 10 people in each of these groups um, across the state. Um, you know, different geographies and demographics included in these groups to really get a lot of different opinions and thoughts, you know, for the most, um, you know, robust takeaways. Um, from these responses and these learnings gathered, we were able to gauge that overall our campaign strategy and approach was, was really well received. You know, we, we were on the right track, um, but we did have some learnings based on the key messaging points that we were able to make adjustments to before we went into market, you know, things that we thought were really um, good insights to apply right off the bat. So what we really found from these focus groups that, you know, people were most interested in the money saving component. You know, everyone said, you know, if this is something I can save money for, for my household or for my business, I'm really interested in learning more. And the fact that they were doing some kind of good for the environment, their community and New Jersey, you know, through having some energy efficient measures and, you know, clean energy. So those were the two things that we, we took away and really morphed into all of our campaign and our messaging and, you know, so far have seen really good success, um, you know, with that initiative. Yeah, I mean, I like when people tell me how I can save money. So I think that <laughs> kind of makes sense, you know. Right. Pretty important these days. <laughs> yeah, Especially with the price of energy. Mm -hmm. True. Um, so that leads me to the next uh, kind of bucket that we have here. Um, when it comes to one-to-one -to -one customer messaging, what kind of research can you accomplish there? Yeah, I think that's, you know, for us at, at MarketSmith, we do, as does it, we've, we've looked at creative testing, sort of broad stroke, but smaller focus groups to get really deep insights. I touched on some syndicated resources before, um, which are very broad and very broad in general. One-to-one, -one, it, it, it can be a very interesting um, place uh, to do research. And one of my favorite examples um, since I've been here is uh, working with uh, one of our state-based uh, New Jersey clients. Um, they were seeing significant year-over-year -year loss in their customer retention. 
Um, so we worked with them to evaluate their database of over 500,000 customer records for both um, new signups as well as uh, canceled uh, uh, contracts. Um, and so we took that information, cross-referenced long-term customers, new customers who've been active for less than 12 months, uh, people who have canceled in the past several years to develop a four-tier communication strategy for them um, that included retention, upsell, conversion, reactivation. Um, so within the study, what we were looking at was really segmenting out those 500,000 records based on cancellation reasons, geographic indicators, demographic data, as well as socioeconomic indicators. So we could understand where are those opportunities and how can we really discuss one-on-one -on -one with each one of those individual people. Um, so we took that information, we developed uh, recommendations for outreach programs, including messaging, messaging cadence, delivery methods, um, et cetera, based on those segmentations. Uh, for example, uh, one of our core uh, customer groups within the segments where they had signed up for a lot of contracts and canceled a lot, um, we found that that group was leaving most often because they had purchased a new product and that product came with a manufacturer service plan. Mm. Well, this group fell into one of two buckets depending on, on the time lapse between when they had signed up for their original contract and when they had canceled. Um, if they were in the reactivation group, um, they were they they had signed up a while ago and had been lapsed for at least a year. And then there was a retention group that we looked at as well, who had signed up within the last 12 months, but had also canceled within the last 12 months. Um, so with the retention group, sorry, with the reactivation group, we looked at it and said, you know, these folks should receive messages periodically to remind them, for example, that a manufacturer plan is limited, that they can reactivate the plan through this client at any time. Um, so just a, a quarterly cadence of don't forget, you can add this, your manufacturer's plan is gonna be limited. Uh, yeah. Within the retention group, right, what we saw, again, the highest number of cancellations was within the first 12 months. That's huge. Well, to retain those customers, a regular, a more regular cadence and electronic cadence, meaning email, um, text messaging, et cetera, could be utilized to remind them of the value that they were getting with this particular client, right? Um, so there's an opportunity there uh, with, with both of them. But we took a database of 500,000 consumers and broke it down to this is how you can communicate with these people literally one-on-one, -on -one, direct mail, email, text messaging, but literally one-on-one -on -one messaging with this consumer group. Yeah, so I think that's interesting because I think it goes back to what we were talking about with qualitative and quantitative. It's between the two, the creative testing and then the one-to-one -one customer messaging. Those are two very different ways to, to take research and boil it up to you know those key points that you need to then build a strategy so i guess then that leads me to my last bucket here which is media strategy um and and what kind of research that we we do there to, to get to that that media um plan that we're we're going to put out there yeah and i think it's a it's a great segue there as well nicole um both of the creative testing and the one-on-one -on -one segmentation included qualitative and quantitative aspects, right? And when we think about uh, incorporating research to drive media strategy, you have to cover both of those as well. Um, to me, I think a great example of that is, um, is the Department of Human Services for the state of New Jersey um, and their REACH NJ uh, medical, medication assisted treatment program. Um, I always get tripped up on that. I want to say medical <laughs> assisted treatment, but so we always use abbreviations here. <laughs> <laughs> it is a lot easier to say three letters. <laughs> yeah, sure. <laughs> um, so this one, this one covers off on on a couple of things, but it's essentially a twofold story where we looked at both creative development and and Des can probably get into a little more detail there, um, but also media channel insights. 
Um, so through focus groups, we discovered that the most significant impact that substance use disorder had on, on con customers, consumers, was the loss of connection to their family and friends um, that that substance use can, can drive or lead to. And that led us to a focus of the campaign where a lot of uh, family connections and a lot of family interactions happen, which is the kitchen table, right? Um, simultaneously, while we were doing the research on the creative side, we were evaluating the last two years of media data and call data. So looking at each individual week for the media channels that were active and how call volume reacted to the media channels that were implemented at the time. We were able to take that information, develop insights and recommendations on an improved media mix. And we looked down to the day part mix for each of the channels, whether it was TV or radio, was there a geographic mix with our at home that really performed better or worse? We looked at it from a multitude of, of angles. All of that informed our newest campaign and the implementation of those recommendations led to an 80 to 85% increase in call volume while media was active compared to prior periods. Um, wow. And for us, internally, that's huge. This campaign literally is saving lives. So it's critically important. And we were able to, to take our media knowledge, our media expertise, and our research and drive stronger engagement with, with the state of New Jersey. Yeah, I think that's, you know, such a perfect end-to-end -end example and, you know, another media strategy and tactic that came out of, you know, these learnings is, you know, we did see such an increase in the call volume when the media was running and active, you know, during some downtimes that we didn't have any media that was um, running and in market, the phones weren't ringing, people weren't calling. So we knew our, our media was the driver of that. So from that, we came up with an, you know, an always on media strategy. We knew we always had to have something in market and running, um, you know, to keep those uh, calls going. So, you know, having all of these, you know, learnings of the onset of the planning process, you know, coupled with, you know, what we learned across the different waves of the campaign and continuing to do follow up, you know, surveys and, you know, metrics by looking at our ads that were driving the strongest interact interaction and engagement. You know, we really, you know, stay on top of this. And it's, you know, kind of something that we're just going to continue to be using this research, you know, to optimize our approach, inform the marketing strategy for all future um, efforts, and then find new opportunities to reach our audience in an impactful way. You know, this isn't, we did research, then we, we moved on. You know, it's continuing to do that research throughout. Yeah, and I think this is a great example because I started out by saying that this would be, you know, the building blocks for a strategy. But like you just said, this is something we're continually utilizing to get to our strategy and how to make it better and optimize it. So I just wanted to say thank you to you both. I think this was really insightful and hopefully all the uh, attendees learned about research today. Um, I will ask if anyone has any questions, uh, now's the time to put them into the question module. But before we dive in, um, we would like to again, invite you all to follow us on our social channels. We share lots of information, client updates and agency happenings daily. So we hope you'll stay in touch. Um, so I'm gonna give it a second. Um, we have a couple of questions here. Um, but I'll give it one more minute to see um, if anyone has any other questions. All right, we can start. So, um, Des, I'll I'll post this question to you. How did um, we MarketSmith handle focus groups during the pandemic, and are people moving back to in-person sessions? Yeah, that's such a, a great question and something we definitely needed to um, to work through because of the pandemic. So um, we did uh, did still conduct focus groups during the pandemic uh, in online virtual settings. So we were still able to um, get people into online groups. 
um, you know, have a moderator facilitating these online sessions, similar to what we're doing here right now, it's still a great way to communicate. Um, and we were still able to do those focus groups virtually. Um, kind of the times have changed with the, the way that we do that. So we'll continue to do focus groups virtually, I think, in the future as well. But definitely getting back to doing the in-person focus groups, um, it has shifted that way. Um, because you see a little bit more in person, um, you see body language, people might feel like they want to open up a little bit more. Um, so definitely having both of those options is key. And then during the pandemic, we also utilized online surveys even more. Um, they're such a timely way to get something out and to get quick responses back and be able to evaluate them quickly. So online surveys, pre-pandemic, post-pandemic, you know, all the time is a great way to, um, to, to capitalize on the research. Good answer. Um, so the next question we have here, and Joe, I will pass this one to you. Do you have to have a large budget to do meaningful research? No, you don't. You don't have to have a large budget to do meaningful research. Uh, focus groups are a good example of that. Um, online surveys, I think, are a great example of that um, for a fairly low cost. Uh, you can get really in-depth, very pointed with the questions that you're asking or very in-depth information on customers that you want to talk to. Um, so very short, no, but uh, very long. There's a lot of flexibility within the world of research to gather information. Um, and that's for primary research. For secondary research, think about the internet. There's a ton of data out there that's published that's just dying to be found and utilized. And there's really no cost other than an internet connection to get to that data. So yeah. I think there's opportunity abounds. Yeah, and that discovery, you know, goal setting phase that we talked about, you know, that's something that's incorporated in our, you know, our scopes of work with our clients because that's just mm -hmm. something that needs to get done, you know. So um, yeah, that side of it, there's not a, a big cost that goes into it. That's just part of um, partnering and doing business, you know, to get all that information. Yeah. And I'm sure, you know, anyone on the research team would say any research is meaningful research. So <laughs> I think, you know, that's probably part of it, too. To your point, Des, if we're no matter what we're doing, we're making sure that it's knowledge backed. Um, yes. So I think I think that's an important, you know, thing to think about there. Yeah, just to add a little bit to that, right? The the value is in how you use it, not necessarily what it is. The smallest tidbit could be extremely meaningful and a massive database could lead you nowhere. So it's really in how you're using the research and analyzing the information. Yep. Great. So thank you again, Des and Joe, for the insightful banter. And thank you to everyone for attending and for your questions. Please um, be sure to join us for our next webinar on September 14th, where we're going to be discussing Connected TV, which is a really um, hot channel and it's a, it's a tactic that we utilize a lot here. Um, and we'll be discussing you know, tactical best practices for both media and creative. So we hope to see you there. Again, thank you both and um, see you guys at the next one. Thank you. Thank Thanks, you. Everybody.